Hey listeners, we at New Alliance are excited about the launch of our print magazine. The first quarterly issue hit the shelves on January 17 this year. And if you're in the United States, you can head over to your nearest Barnes & Noble bookstore to pick up your copy. The next issue is set for mid-April. For those listening from abroad, please contact subscriptions at newlinesmag.com for more information about getting a copy delivered to your home in the near future. On behalf of all of us at New Lines, thanks for your ongoing support, and we hope you will enjoy reading our magazine in print too. Now back to Wider Angle. This is New Lines Magazine's Wider Angle podcast. I'm your host, Riada ashimovic Rogers Brubaker is a distinguished professor of sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Brubaker has written widely on social theory, immigration, citizenship, nationalism, populism, and his most recent book is called Hyperconnectivity in Its Discontents. And we will talk about the book today and various transformations of the self and within society. I'm very pleased that you found the time to join me today, Mr. Brubaker. Welcome to Wider Angle. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start. What kind of challenges or what kind of changes and domains are you tackling in your book, Hyperconnectivity and Its Discontents? The book casts a wide net because I wanted to emphasize that digital hyperconnectivity has changed just about everything. That's why I call hyperconnectivity a total social fact, meaning that it leaves no domain of life untouched. The most obvious changes have been in the textures and rhythms of everyday life. But hyperconnectivity has also changed underlying social structures. But to be a little more specific, the book is organized around five domains, the self, interactions, culture, economics, and politics. So perhaps I could give a very brief preview of each of these, and then we can come back and talk about some of them in more detail. Sure. So Mm -hmm. By changes in the self, I mean changes in how we come to know the self, how we evaluate the self, how we promote the self, and how we regulate our emotions and moods. Changes in interactions, that's my second domain, have transformed all kinds of social relationships, family relationships, uh, friendship, dating and sexuality, and of course, professional relationships as well. And I focus in this chapter on how interactions are organized in space and time and how that has changed so profoundly. But I'm also interested in how digital interactions tend to proliferate, often leaving us feeling overburdened and struggling to keep up with the flow. I'm interested in how interactions that are digitally mediated make possible new kinds of social surveillance by friends and uh, partners and parents. Uh, And I'm interested in how interactions are steered and shaped and partly automated by platforms and software. Looking at changes in culture, and that's my third domain, I highlight the sheer abundance of digital culture, uh, which is thrilling, but also disorienting and a bit numbing. And I take up the question of whether digital abundance has a democratizing effect on culture. In the economic domain, that's my fourth sphere, I focus on the rise of the digital platform as a powerful new organizational form, and I consider how platforms have transformed sector after sector of social life, from lodging, transportation, commerce, to education, journalism, public debate, and many more. And I'm particularly interested in how platforms have changed the way that labor is recruited and carried out and controlled. And then finally, in the political sphere, I show how hyperconnectivity has transformed how we know the public world, how we feel about public affairs, and how we are governed, not only by the state, but also by the private tech platforms that play an increasingly important role in governing public life, even though they're private organizations. Yeah, so we will address each one of those in a little bit more detail. Um, Let's start with digital hyperconnectivity first. What is that condition or environment, as you assert? What does that hyper in hyperconnectivity mean? How far does it all go? 
Sure. So what I mean by hyperconnectivity, to exaggerate only a little bit, is that everyone and everything is connected to everyone and everything else everywhere and all the time. So hyperconnectivity in this sense is a relatively recent phenomenon. It was consolidated, I would argue, only around the middle of the last decade when smartphones and social media use became nearly universal. Now, of course, digital connectivity, as opposed to what I'm calling hyperconnectivity, has a much, much longer history. It's already been 30 years, for example, that we've had web browsers. The history of network computers goes back further than that. But hyperconnectivity, for me, is something much more specific than digital connectivity and uh, much more recent. And it involves a whole complex of things, including near universal mobile broadband connectivity, the immense infrastructure of data extraction and analysis, the incredibly rapid leaps in machine learning that have resulted from all that data, uh, the infrastructure of cloud computing, and all the things that these developments have made possible. And it might be useful to also explain how the hyper in that hyper connectivity, as you argue, is also about the where and when, and not just about the who and what of connectivity, right? Yes, exactly. So we tend to think first of the who and what, uh, and the scale of that connectivity is truly staggering. So, you know, we might think Facebook is so passe and uncool and doesn't matter anymore, but it connects 3 billion people. Mm -hmm. uh, and WhatsApp and uh, Instagram connect over 2 billion each. You know, it's too obvious to say, but it's worth remembering that a billion, that is a thousand million, is a really, really, really large number. Mm -hmm. And frictionless connectivity on that planetary scale is something radically new in human history. And it's not just people who are hyperconnected. More and more of digital connectivity, in fact, involves connections between things and not just, say, the smart devices in our homes, but the hundreds of billions of networked sensors and tagged objects that communicate with one another without any humans in the loop. So that's the who and the what. But as you say, the hyper in hyperconnectivity um, is also about the where and when of connectivity. So the anytime, anywhere logic of hyperconnectivity has broken down the boundaries between previously distinct spheres of life. You could think of the boundaries between home and work or uh, between private and public or work and play. But connectivity is not just anywhere and anytime that is anywhere I want it, anytime I want it. The vision of Silicon Valley is that it should be everywhere and always. In other words, connectivity should become ambient, which means that it will be diffused throughout the environment rather than dependent on devices like smartphones uh, as it is today. And you started talking a little bit about it in the introduction. I'm curious to hear more about the ways that hyperconnectivity has created new ways of knowing and imagining the self. I and mean, you speak about and write about different ways that we act or think. So tell us more about that. Sure. So I think self-knowledge is a universal cultural ideal. But how do we gain self-knowledge? And what does it mean to know oneself? Different cultural and religious traditions have given different answers to this question, but hyperconnectivity allows for a radically new kind of answer in that it holds out the prospect of knowing the self through numbers rather than through words, through objective data rather than through subjective introspection, through the tracking of behavior rather than through the plumbing of the depths of the soul. Now, some people have become enthusiastic participants in the so-called quantified self movement. And these are people who are eager to adopt the latest self-tracking technologies. And it's truly amazing the number of different aspects of the self that can be tracked. But in a broader sense, all of us who use social media have become quantified selves. That is, whether or not we have any interest in self-tracking, this is because all activities on social media platforms are relentlessly quantified and fed back to the user in a series of numbers. And these numbers have powerful effects on how we understand ourselves and how we evaluate ourselves. So there's a lot of evidence, for example, and psychologists 
Jonathan Haidt has been doing very interesting work on this, that the relentless quantification on Facebook and especially Instagram may be harming the mental health of young people and of adolescent girls in particular who are constantly comparing themselves to others on social media and feeling bad about themselves <laughs> what, because they seems to be that others are having more fun or looking more attractive or getting more likes. Now, of course, these social comparisons weren't invented by social media. They're a universal part of social life, but social media makes social comparison salient and inescapable and so much easier. And it tends to function, that is, social media tends to function as a result, as a gigantic machine for manufacturing envy, or Mm. at least accentuating envy. And there's evidence that social media may be contributing to depression and anxiety as well. But it's not only adolescents who are susceptible to this kind of feedback. You know, look, I'm not a big social media user myself, but I've been posting regularly on Twitter in the last couple of months about matters connected with my book. And I have felt myself becoming a quantified self against my will, you know, because it's hard to resist being hyper aware of the metrics and being drawn in to a comparative and competitive concern with attention. It's hard to resist wondering why some posts get more engagement than others. It's hard to resist envying those with larger followings and so on. So every time I check the metrics, which I have to admit is embarrassingly often, I am participating in these new ways of knowing and evaluating the self. Well, you're very genuine about it. At least you acknowledge how that has impacted you. And I mean, you're speaking also about all sorts of social interactions. So tell us more about how has hyperconnectivity recast all these interactions from the most intimate to the most impersonal as well, right? Absolutely. So I highlight four themes in my discussion of interactions. The first involves the reorganization of space and time. And I want to come back to this and say more about it because I think it's the most profound change. But let me briefly mention the other themes about the changing nature of interactions that I highlight. The second theme is the proliferation of what I call micro-sociality and the burdens of keeping up with that proliferation on all the different channels. The third theme is the new kinds of visibility that are created by digital interaction because face-to-face interactions are evanescent. You know, They leave traces only in our memories, but the visible traces and, as it were, transcripts of much digitally mediated interaction live on indefinitely. And this creates new possibilities for what has been called social surveillance. That is the surveillance of friends and romantic partners, for example, or the surveillance of children by parents. And the final theme that I highlight in the chapter is how interactions are channeled, programmed, engineered, and even automated by digital platforms and software. But let me come back now and say a little more about that first theme that is about the reorganization of space and time. Now, there's an obvious aspect of this, which is that interactions have been freed from the constraints of proximity and simultaneity. So you don't have to be in the same place with someone else, and you don't have to synchronize your activities to occur at the same time. And this makes possible the new kinds of asynchronous interactions that we have on messaging apps and social media platforms, as well as new kinds of synchronous interaction, like the conversation that you and I are having right now. But hyperconnectivity also organizes or reorganizes space and time in more profound and less obvious ways. And I'd like to mention three of these. So one way that it does this is by creating new forms of what I call absent presence and present absence. And what I mean by this is that people who are physically absent Mm -hmm. can be rendered present in mediated but compelling ways, while those who are physically present may be mentally or emotionally absent, absorbed in feeds from elsewhere or connected to distant others. And more generally, this is the second change I want to mention, um, hyperconnectivity levels all distinctions of time and place. So it not only blurs the boundaries between home and the outside world and between working and non-working time, it erodes all spatial and temporal 
boundaries. And the result is that there's no longer a time and a place for everything, right? Uh, institutional time, institutionally defined places and times give way to individually negotiated spatial and temporal arrangements. And that may be seen as a kind of freedom, but it also may be experienced as a kind of burden. And the final theme I want to highlight in this connection is the fragmentation of time. Mm -hmm. So digital activities are easy to break up into multiple temporal fragments. This means that we can pack small bits of digital activity into even the smallest nooks and crannies of otherwise empty time. So time on an elevator, uh, for example, or time between sets at the gym or time at a stoplight, they become occasions for sending a text or watching a TikTok. Now, you might think that effectively and efficiently packing bits of digital activity into available slots of empty or underutilized time would somehow save us time. It would relieve time pressure elsewhere. But it doesn't seem to work that way in practice because the frictionless convenience of digital activity and our habits of multitasking lead us to undertake more and more activities per unit of time. So time pressures end up intensifying rather than diminishing under hyperconnectivity. And technology that should, in principle, save us time leaves us feeling more harried than ever. I'm nodding with approval. Not sure whether I feel better that it's not just me because I feel seen, <laughs> that it's not just that I feel a little bit less guilty about this or that it is um, so overwhelmingly frightening um, in terms of how, how you describe it. But it's it's absolutely accurate. Um, and when we speak, for example, about hyperconnectivity of culture or for culture, you argue that the enthusiasm about digital culture remains vibrant in contrast with some more um, disappointment with political and economic ramifications for hyperconnectivity. Tell me a little bit about these um, ramifications for culture of hyperconnectivity. Uh, I, there's absolutely been a big disappointment in the way hyperconnectivity has played out in the economic and the political sphere. So just to briefly mention that, you know, in the economic sphere, the enthusiasm of a decade ago about things like the sharing economy mm -hmm. has given way to a much more sober and critical evaluation of what some people call platform capitalism or surveillance capitalism. And it's given way to a concern with the enormous and largely unaccountable power of the great tech platforms. And indeed, more recently, even since I finished writing the book, enthusiasm about the utopian possibilities of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology has also been dashed. And then in the political sphere, meanwhile, the dream of digital democracy has given way to nightmares of digital polarization, and digital authoritarianism. But in the sphere of culture, there's still quite a lot of enthusiasm about hyperconnectivity, as you say. And that enthusiasm is focused on three things. First, there's excitement about the sheer abundance of digital culture. Mm. And that's totally understandable. Mm. I share that excitement. It's thrilling to have an infinitely rich world of cultural products at my fingertips anytime and anywhere. Secondly, there's excitement about the decommodification of culture. That is about the fact that digital culture is not only abundant, but it's often freely available without any price tag attached to it. So the utopian idea that digital culture should be freely shared rather than bought and sold remains attractive and powerful. And third, there's excitement about the democratization of digital mm -hmm. culture, about the ways in which ordinary people and not just cultural elites can participate in the production and circulation of culture. So there's a real basis for the excitement about digital culture, but at the same time, we need to look critically at celebratory accounts of abundance and decommodification and democratization. So let's think for a moment about digital cultural abundance. It's certainly exhilarating, but it's also, I would argue, flattening and homogenizing in that the infinitely varied 
universe of cultural products is converted into content mm. as it blurs and it blurs together as it flows through the same conduits and across the same interfaces in an endless, undifferentiated stream. So we encounter more culture than ever, but we engage it more superficially. We find ourselves chronically distracted. We lose our capacity for sustained engagement. And as we struggle to keep up with the accelerating flow, we're drawn by the perpetual lure of the new, we come to know less and less about more and more. Now, as for decommodification, I think it's hugely outweighed by recommodification. Hmm. Yeah, Wikipedia is a shining example of collaborative, non-market-oriented cultural production. But as I say in the book, it's a lonely island in an immense sea of monetization. And as the volume of cultural content increases, attention becomes an ever scarcer resource and a resource that's ever more precisely measured and monetized. And even amateur cultural production then is increasingly oriented to trying to get a share of that measurable, monetizable attention. So digital culture has ultimately not been decommodified. Instead, culture and commerce are locked in an ever tighter embrace. In one of myriad intellectual stimulating and provocative sentences, you do say that the question is not just how many people engage in cultural production, but also how people engage, which you address a little bit right now. And so um, what would then, in your opinion, mean to democratize cultural creativity if popularity cannot be the main criteria for that cultural democratization as it has been celebrated? Yes, the, I think the question of cultural democratization is, is complicated because on the one hand, it's true that inexpensive, user-friendly tools for the manipulation of words and images and sounds, and you could think of things like Photoshop or GarageBand, it's true that these tools have dramatically broadened access to the means of cultural production. And this has blurred the previously sharp lines between professional and amateur production, and it's dramatically broadened the range of those who can participate in cultural production. But as you say, the question is not only how many people engage in cultural production, it's how they engage. So we're told, for example, that AI tools will help everyone express their creativity, say in music and art, for example. So AI image generators like OpenAI's Dolly have gotten a lot of attention. And there's an AI music company called Amper that promises to let everyone, and I quote, create their own original music in seconds. But let's just pause on that for a moment. You know, what does it mean to create when you are creating your own original music in seconds? Is creativity going to be reduced to editing and tweaking AI-generated music or to coming up with a clever prompt for an image generator? Or consider TikTok, which promises to enable everyone to be a creator, but does so arguably by de-skilling and automating the labor of cultural creativity. Though I, I admit this isn't new, uh, already in the late 19th century, Kodak came up with the slogan, you press the button and we do the rest. Mm. So is there an alternative to democratization through automation and de-skilling? Yeah, I think that there is. My own view is that a genuine democratization of cultural creativity would promote the development of skills and capacities rather than minimize the need for them, which is the route that we seem to be taking now. And I would make a similar point about popularity mm -hmm. and democratization. So from what you might call a cultural populist point of view, if digital culture gives people what they like and what they want, then that makes it democratic that makes it democratic. End of story. But as I argue um, popularity cannot be the sole criterion of cultural democratization. As I see it, a democratic politics of culture would not just seek to create the perfect algorithm that will give people exactly what they like and want. It would seek rather to promote learning and growth and discovery and development.
Hmm. And you recently posted online in your um on your Twitter account how many have also noted affinities between digital hyperconnectivity and neoliberalism, especially via promotion of self-entrepreneurship. And in your book too, like here in this conversation, you mentioned also the celebration of sharing economy and um, that idea of a shift of ownership from individual and that individualistic competition to network collaboration. But I'm curious to hear from you about something that you argue that we can also see or begin to see the social infrastructure of a post-neoliberal self emerge. I'm very curious to hear more, a little bit more about that. What do you mean by that? Um, let me introduce that notion of the post-neoliberal mm-hmm. self by saying something about first about the connection between hyperconnectivity and neoliberalism. Mm-hmm. That it, there are a couple of connections. One is that digital platforms reduce what economists call transaction costs to an absolute minimum. And this means as a result that all kinds of new transactions become possible, right? Transactions that previously would have been way too complicated to arrange or too costly. And this proliferation of transactions represents in effect an extension of the market logic into non-market areas of life. And that extension of market principles is central to neoliberalism. A second connection is through the fostering of self-entrepreneurship, as, as you mentioned, both in the literal sense that many millions of people have become micro-entrepreneurs by selling goods or services on digital platforms, but also in a metaphorical sense. That is the sense in which even people who aren't literally selling goods or services online are strongly encouraged to sell themselves. And you know, what I mean by this is that we're encouraged to produce and promote a digital self that will be consumed by others. Uh, you see this logic most clearly, of course, in the case of influencers. Mm-hmm. But in a sense, it's not just influencers, right? It's all of us who use social media who are drawn in to the game of self-entrepreneurship. Just as I said earlier, that we're all drawn into being a quantified self. We're all drawn into this practice of creating a digital persona that will command value in the brutally competitive market for attention. Then the third um, connection between hyperconnectivity and neoliberalism, and this is the one that's most closely related into the post-neoliberal self, Mm -hmm. this is the idea that hyperconnectivity supports the neoliberal project of governing people at a distance through the choices that they make. But at the same time, digital platforms they also limit our choices. And you can think, for example, of, uh, to take a very trivial example, drop-down menus that pre-specify what our choices are. Mm -hmm. Or a somewhat more important example, you could think of algorithmic filters that shape what we see and as a result, limit what we can choose. Mm -hmm. Or you could think of the way that so-called choice architecture is used to nudge us in a particular direction. And it should encourage us to ask difficult questions about what it can mean to be an autonomous self if we are increasingly enmeshed in systems of algorithmic uh, governance and artificial intelligence. Speaking of knowledge and governance, I am curious to hear more about how you describe or see the ways that hyperconnectivity transformed how we learn politically relevant knowledge. So what do you mean by changes in what you call or describe as regimes of knowing, regimes of feeling, and regimes of governing? Yes, let me begin with the first with regimes of knowing. (laughs) Most discussions of the relation between knowledge and politics uh, focus on misinformation. That's a key topic, but I wanted to think more broadly about how hyperconnectivity has transformed what we know uh, about the public world uh, and how we know, right? Or how we think we know it. Um, And I focus on what I call the decline of a shared public world, a world in which there used to be a sense of a shared reality, even though people, of course, had very different ideas about what to do about that shared reality. Today, even that sense of a shared reality, a minimal shared reality, is often absent. So during the pandemic, for example, even the most basic descriptive facts about the situation were bitterly disputed. Now, obviously, bitter disputes are nothing new, but 
the digital knowledge landscape makes it so much easier for people to construct and inhabit radically different public worlds, each one fortified with its own inexhaustible supply of easily accessible online evidence. Uh, and I should say, um, for those on the audio feed, I'm using the word evidence in scare quotes because what counts as evidence uh, to me may not count as evidence to you. But it's not just ways of knowing the public world that have changed. It's also ways of feeling. And I focus here on the mobilization of moral outrage. Obviously, again, this is not a new phenomenon, but it has been supercharged by hyperconnectivity. And this is because the algorithms that govern the circulation of digital content are optimized for engagement. And moral outrage, as psychologists have shown, is extremely engaging. So content providers and individuals as well as organizations have an incentive to produce content that um, expresses outrage. And once such content is in circulation, then it's very convenient for others to join in, and pile on and express outrage of their own. So social media not only reduce the cost of expressing outrage, but also they provide an immediate and gratifying feedback for doing so. And this creates the perfect environment for what has been called moral grandstanding. And that is, it basically refers to the idea of trying to gain status by appealing to an audience through heavily moralized talk, like expressions of moral outrage. And as for regimes of governing, I mean the new technologies of algorithmic governance that are based on machine learning and on the extraction and analysis of enormous quantities of data. And I distinguish here between governance and governments in that alg algorithmic governance is, yes, it's used by government agencies. So some examples would be the use of predictive algorithms to guide decisions by judges or social workers or police departments. Um, but algorithmic governance is even more developed in the private sector by the great tech platforms themselves. And even though they're private companies, they're deeply involved in the governance of public life. And the most crucial respect in which that is true is that the proprietary and opaque algorithms govern who sees what and who can say what in the digital public sphere. So those algorithms govern who sees what because they determine what shows up in our feeds or what shows up in response to our search queries. And they govern who can say what through their policies and practices of content moderation. So as a result, private platforms enorm enjoy enormous and really unchecked power over public discussion. It's really interesting how listening to you reminds me of in parts of a similar conversation on, with the mathematician Kathy O'Neill, who wrote a book, Shame Machine. And she mentions, you mentioned Manufacture of Envy a couple of minutes ago and Manufacture of Moral Rage. And we spoke about Manufacture of Shame and how digital platforms have made that explode in a way and the transformations that it had caused in the society, which are ongoing. So then, but I'm curious, so you think that participatory democratic promise has not been as materialized as it has been greatly exaggerated, right? So I think that's correct. I would make here a similar point about the democratization of politics um, to what I said about the democratization of culture. So hyperconnectivity has opened up new avenues of participation in the political sphere, just as in the cultural sphere. And as a result, a much broader range of people are participating in public conversations, just as a much broader range of people are participating in the production and circulation of culture. But in both cases, what matters for democratization is not just how many people participate, but again, how they participate. And the trouble with hyperconnectivity in the political sphere is that it makes certain kinds of participation really easy, but it makes other kinds of participation that really are important for democracy really hard. So digital platforms make it super easy to sign a petition or join a pile on or express outrage, and they make it easy to organize and coordinate protests. But these platforms make it hard, maybe even impossible, to discuss complex issues in a nuanced way, right? Or hard, make it very hard to craft compromises or very hard to build durable organizations as opposed to a one-time street demonstration. So 
on balance, I would indeed say that the participatory democratic promise of hyperconnectivity has not been realized because democracy requires deliberation and hyperconnectivity has been really terrible for deliberation. And democracy, I would add, also requires trust in institutions and hyperconnectivity has accelerated the erosion of trust. Tell us, when did you write this book? And I'm asking this because I'm curious to learn how have all these changes accelerated um, during the pandemic or how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect all these transformations that you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So I started the book just before the pandemic. And then, you know, the pandemic changed everything. I started working on other things. I didn't even go back to it for a year. Uh, and, and then I realized, of course, that the pandemic made the book project more relevant than ever. Mm -hmm. right? So I like to say that hyperconnectivity prepared us for the pandemic, but the pandemic has prepared us for an even more digitally hyperconnected future. Hyperconnectivity mm -hmm. prepared us for the pandemic in the sense that the pre-existing digital infrastructure is what made the sudden pivot to online everything possible, right? No pre-existing infrastructure, lockdowns would have been unthinkable, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly we pivot to online work, except for the so-called essential workers, online schooling, online shopping, online therapy, online religion, online entertainment, online sociability, and so on. This incredibly rapid shift, basically from one day to the next, was possible only because a massive um, pre-existing, sophisticated digital infrastructure was already in place. Mm -hmm. And indeed, many people already before the pandemic had been living in a kind of their own little digital quarantines, right? Never going out because of everything you could do online. But the pandemic didn't just showcase the existing digital infrastructure. It provided a golden opportunity. You know, there's this expression, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And the big tech platforms didn't want to waste mm -hmm. this crisis. They wanted to use it as an opportunity to reimagine the digital future. So as Naomi Klein, the theorist of disaster capitalism, put it um, somewhat hyperbolically, the tech giants were using the pandemic as a living laboratory to work out and test their vision for a permanent, I quote here, a permanent and highly profitable no-touch future. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but more concretely, the pandemic was indeed a breakthrough moment, for example, in the educational technology so-called ed tech sector. Uh, ed tech had been gaining ground long before the pandemic, but the pandemic was an extraordinary opportunity for tech platforms to make themselves indispensable by providing key infrastructural services at every level of education, in every phase of education. The platforms were able to move quickly. They could offer free tools um, very quickly on a huge scale to assure that emergency need for continuity and instruction. But this left them well positioned then to promote their own vision of the future of education, a future of personalized or hyper-personalized and soon AI-assisted digital instruction, a future of surveillance intensive tracking and so on. They had been pushing that before the pandemic, but there was a lot of skepticism about tracking and privacy and so on. And suddenly this becomes you know, a much more plausible um, vision of the future. And there were similar, the pandemic provided a similar golden opportunity for digital initiatives in the sphere of medicine and public health and the sphere of entertainment, you know, with new forms of so-called digital liveness, uh, mm -hmm. the sphere of remote work, of course. And then on a grander scale, the pandemic gave new impetus to attempts to reimagine social life in its entirety, uh, in part through this idea of the metaverse, understood as some kind of all-encompassing virtual or digitally augmented space in which all kinds of activities could be carried out, work, social, leisure, and so on. Now, there was a lot of hype around the metaverse in 2021. That hype has died down. You know, hype moves on to new subjects. But with Facebook committing to invest $10 billion a year uh, in this area, and with many other tech companies investing heavily in their own visions of the metaverse, um, it seems clear that virtual reality and augmented reality technologies will indeed play an increasingly important role uh, in our lives in the relatively near future. And the pandemic helped make that plausible.
Speaking of future and kind of as we approach the end of this conversation, I'm you in your book, you're right of three dystopian visions in the conclusion. Um, two are drawn from fiction, one from social science, and they highlight all these ways in which hyperconnectivity has enhanced different manipulation, I guess, or control. So I'm just curious, if, is there a way that we mention them but still by not giving too many spoilers so that the readers engage in more depth with the book because they're fascinating. I'm not going to say options, but visions. As you say, I take two of these uh, dystopian visions from classics of 20th century fiction, Orwell's 1984 and Huxley's Brave New World. And both of these are visions of dictatorship. But as the media theorist and and cultural critic Neil Postman argued, um, they're very different visions. So Uh, Orwell's vision is a brutal dictatorship, a dictatorship of fear. Huxley's vision is kind of a gentle dictatorship, a dictatorship that's based on distractions and abundance and all kinds of nice things and so on, conditioning, pleasure. Postman was writing in 1985, and that was a moment when the cultural and political landscape was dominated by television. And his point was that Huxley's vision of the gentle dictatorship was more relevant than Orwell's. Now, in today's context of ubiquitous digital surveillance, there's been a resurgence of interest in Orwell. But still, Orwell's grim vision, which was formed um, very profoundly by his response to the mid-20th century totalitarian regimes, has limited relevance today, since today's systems of surveillance, even though they're much more pervasive and much more sophisticated than anything that Orwell could have imagined. Uh, Yep, they're configured in very different ways, and they're uh, employed for very different purposes. Whereas Huxley's Brave New World, by contrast, doesn't have much to say about surveillance, but its emphasis on a ceaseless flow of immediate gratifications, uh, engrossing experiences, and compelling distractions remains very relevant today. I mean, that sounds like a picture of the metaverse, right, As as it's described. Huxley worried that a really efficient dictatorship in the future would not even try to, it would not even need to rely on coercion because it could make its subjects love their servitude. That's his phrase, um, through conditioning and drugs and distractions. So both 1984 and Brave New World focus on the state. But the third dystopian vision that I discuss is not driven by the state. It's driven by an economic logic. And I take this vision, as you say, not from fiction, but from Shoshana Zuboff's recent book, Surveillance Capitalism. The core mechanism for Zuboff is the extraction and analysis of enormous quantities of data from every aspect of our lives, online lives, our offline lives, with the help of machine learning, This data generates an endless stream of marketable and actionable predictions about our future behavior. And these fine-grained predictions then enable surveillance capitalism both to know our behavior in exquisite detail and to shape our behavior. But if you, you know, I'm not interested so much in the particular particulars of each of these visions. So I wanted to abstract from these three dystopian visions. And then I think you can read Orwell and Huxley and Zuboff as suggesting how hyperconnectivity enhances what I call technologies of control, technologies of distraction, and technologies of manipulation. So it enhances technologies of control by creating an infrastructure for unilateral and authoritarian modes of governance, both public and private. I don't mean to say that, therefore, all connectivity is used for that purpose, but just that it's very useful for that purpose. So if you want to have a very efficient means of control, this provides an immensely um, useful infrastructure for that. Hyperconnectivity enhances technologies of distraction by providing an infrastructure for capturing and diverting and holding our attention. And it enhances technologies of manipulation by providing an infrastructure for sophisticated forms of behavioral nudging. And you could think of this as a kind of 21st century equivalent of the Skinnerian idea of behavior modification, but one that embraces embraces the entire planet. So this 
dystopian picture of intensified control, intensified distraction, intensified manipulation is obviously very one-sided. Um, you know, I try to balance it in the book by also analyzing more individually empowering aspects mm. of hyperconnectivity. I discuss, for example, how hyperconnectivity creates new ways of exploring the self and even emancipating the self, you know, for better or worse, from forms of social control that are based in families and local communities. Or hyperconnectivity obviously provides new and wonderful possibilities for keeping in touch with friends and families and mm -hmm. lovers at a, at a distance. Uh, and as we've discussed, hyperconnectivity opens up new avenues of popular participation in the realm of culture, in the realm of economics, in the realm of politics. But even though hyperconnectivity has empowered individuals in these respects and in other respects, I think it has more powerfully and more profoundly empowered organizations and precisely those organizations that are in a position to extract and analyze data on an enormous scale. So, you know, thinking back a few decades in its early phases, digital connectivity, before hyperconnectivity, digital connectivity probably con contributed to the decentralization and dispersion of power. But the transition to hyperconnectivity about a decade ago brought about an immense reconcentration and Recentralization of power. So, yeah, in the end, my account is a fairly pessimistic one. And you mentioned the word prediction. And so, as the last question of the conversation, without obviously being able to predict what will happen, I, as I ask um, each one of my guests about the wider angle of this work. And when we speak about significance of hyperconnectivity, obviously, we're speaking about such an over encompassing, not just technological aspect. So, tell us maybe about some avenues of thinking that we can use to talk about what our digital future might look like in all its in in all encompassing terms uh, well as we as we've discussed my book indeed adopts a kind of wide angle lens so you know instead of focusing in depth on a single issue i've tried to sketch the big picture by treating hyperconnectivity as a total social fact that has transformed every sphere of life so in a sense our whole conversation has, in a sense, had a pretty wide angle, and I think we've covered a lot of ground. You know, as for predictions, sociologists are, are not very good at making predictions, so I, I won't venture any here. But perhaps a point worth emphasizing in closing is that I think we need to think closely about the choices that we as a society want to make going forward to establish the frameworks within which new kinds of digital technologies uh, will enter our lives. And I'm talking here about public choices, not about the private choices that we make as individuals about how we want to engage with digital technologies, though those private choices are also quite important. And I want to emphasize the word choices, since we sometimes hear that we have no choice when it comes to new technologies. I don't think this is true. And I think that the discourse of technological inevitabilism, as it's sometimes called, or technological determinism, uh, is actually quite harmful. Because, as I emphasize, hyperconnectivity is not just a technological fact. It's a complex socio-technical phenomenon. And that complexity means that hyperconnectivity is not destined, it's not fated to be organized in any one particular way. One example of that. So, the ecosystem of hyperconnectivity um, that we inhabit today could have been configured differently mm. at key junctures in the past, and it could be configured differently in the future. So, for example, advertising did not have to become the basic business model of the internet. For you could have put in place strict privacy protections that would have banned the long term storage of behavioral data, and then as a result, limited the reach of something like behavioral micro-targeting. And this, in turn, would have removed a key incentive for these immense investments in surveillance and data extraction that were needed precisely in order to pursue the holy grail of ever more effective targeted advertising. So what about going forward? Looking forward, do we want to say fatalistically, you have no privacy, get used to it, or do we want to limit, for example, the circumstances in which facial recognition technologies can be used or other technologies? Do we want to say 
fatalistically, that there's nothing we can do about the degraded digital public sphere. Or, as Ethan Zuckerman and others have suggested, do we want to try to develop new forms of digital media and digital infrastructure that actually could serve public rather than private purposes? Do we want to say fatalistically that generative AI like chat GPT and its more powerful successors, which are just around the corner, um, will change everything, but there's nothing we can do about it except try to play catch up down the road? Or do we try to ensure early on, that means right now, um, the transparency, the accountability, the fairness in the workings of chat GPT and other generative AI? In our deeply polarized environment, will it be possible to construct a public digital infrastructure that uh, might actually support rather than undermine a democratic public sphere? Can the private platforms that organize so much of our lives be made more accountable to public goals? I don't know the answers, but I do know that these questions are ones that we can't afford to neglect. So many questions, and we're speaking of ongoing, complex transformations in fluid states. So I am appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Rogers Brubaker, for joining me at Wider Angle and sharing your insight with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. And for all of you in the audience, stay tuned for more conversations with people from all over the globe. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you all for joining us. You listen to New Lies Magazine's Wider Angle podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Wider Angle and get in touch at podcast at newlinesmag.com. This episode was produced by your host, Triad ashimovic Visit our website to find more resources and information and stay tuned for new conversation next Wednesday.